गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन थैंक्स संजय थैंक्स प्रोफेसर पानीकर एंड थैंक्स फॉर गिविंग दिस टॉपिक विच इज़ सो क्लोज टू माई हार्ट अदर डे आई इज टॉकिंग अबाउट इवॉल्विंग ट्रीटमेंट गाइडलाइन इन टाइप टू डायबिटीज एट डॉक्टर मोहनस एंड हिज कमेंट वॉज लाइक ए सर्टिफिकेट दैट राजीव इट सीम्स दैट योर गाइडलाइंस आर इनग्रेव्ड ऑन योर हार्ट बिकॉज आई सेड दैट वी हैव ऑल बीन पार्ट ऑफ आर एस एस डी आई fortunately i had a opportunity to lead that group but all of us we were part of uh, those guidelines which are now very very i mean very very practical tool and uh, we thought that these were possibly uh, uh, guideline which should be referred to adhere to and uh, whenever we are sitting in a chamber we should always uh, use it as a help uh, as that cardiologist said gm dt that was uh, guideline uh, guided treatment medical treatment in heart failure i think it has to be guideline based management when we when it comes to type 2 diabetes so sanjay asked me to see, uh, speak on uh, key take homes or key takeaways on various international guideline do we have a slide changer or i i do it on okay so i'll start from 2022 because and towards the end i'll to uh, talk about rssdi uh, guidelines because those are published in 20 and uh, this year fortunately with dr sanjay who is one of the most has been one of the most dynamic rssdi secretary we had in last 50 years uh, we are again going to have sooner the guidelines which will be revised guideline 2022 and i am sure these are going to be published in october or november issue of ijjdc also and will be released at uh, chennai annual conference so let me take you through the ada guidelines which are uh, always a sort of gold standard across uh, because we although in terms of numbers uh, rssdi is one of the largest organization maybe after ada it is one of the largest organization in asia but still i think we uh, i i'll not be biased uh, towards rssd guideline but we have not made an impact globally so if it comes to guidelines which are followed across the globe it is the ada standard of care in diabetes which every year on 1st of january gets online so 2022 guideline for the first time talk about criteria for screening for diabetes or p diabetes in asymptomatic individuals and it said that anyone who has a bmi more than 25 and 23 for asian because we know uh, we in our own indian guidelines also we have uh, taken that reference because 23 to 25 is already overweight when it comes to asian phenotype so anyone who has a first degree relation with diabetes who belongs to an ethnicity like african american latino native american or pacific islander those who have history of cvd or hypertension with hdl levels on the lower side and triglyceride on the higher side or a woman with polycystic ovarian disease someone who is not physically active and other clinical condition associated with insulin resistance so if you look upon this table anyone who has more than 25 bmi will have at least one or the other reason for screening for diabetes or pre diabetes even if you are asymptomatic but for all those those who don't have a bmi more than 25 when it is caucasian or more than 23 when once it comes to indian ethnicity if you are a sort of normal then obviously you should be for the first time screened at the age of 35 but people with hiv or uh, those i told you those females those who had gdm they should be screened and even if it is normal it should be repeated every 3 years and uh, if that is abnormal or if it is a pre diabetes detected for the first time then you need to follow these asymptomatic or pre diabetic patient once in a year once it comes to goals of care aim is obviously when we are treating type 2 diabetes we are treating to prevent complication and to optimize quality of life i really like what dr panikar said health span it is not about only longevity which we are talking about that health span so obviously the aim of treatment in type 2 diabetes is not to get only the glycemic reduction 
it is not about the numbers but actually to prevent complication and optimize quality of life so their ada says that you must assess key patient characteristics let it be the current lifestyle which you are following or all comorbidities whether it is presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease ckd or heart failure or other things which are very very important before making a decision on choice of treatment then consider the specific factors that impact choice of treatment so it has to be individualized hva1c target i'll be taking this into greater details because we should opt for the drugs which will have some impact on weight and prevent onset of hypoglycemia and overall side effect of the drug also needs to be considered so today it is no more a doctrine approach that you tell your patient you take this i have prescribed this is the best drug this you must take no it has to be a shared decision making it to create a management plan sit with sit with the patient maybe you may have an educator half work may be done by an educator so patient or the family has to agree on management plan then you need to implement that management plan and ongoing monitoring has to be there of course with the support system and towards then you may review and agree on a management plan so after 6 months or 1 year you realize that in spite of your management plan you have not succeeded that is the time you may review your management management plan and go on a change so ada says that diet physical activity and behavioral therapy an attempt has to be there at least to get more than 5% weight loss close to 7 or 10 will be which will make huge difference in overall outcomes in setting of type 2 diabetes this well uh, slide came as early as 2013 it was a ada asd joint consensus for the first time which talk about this approach to individualization in glycemic targets they are still adhering to that that we need to have a more stringent approach in all those patient those who are newly diagnosed where there are not much of comorbidities where life expectancy is normal or very very low there is no established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and if patient can regularly monitor and is very very highly motivated patient has good resources there you should tie target a very stringent target something like 6.5 all those patient those who are on other end of the spectrum like those who already have comorbidities established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or their life expectancy is low obviously they will be not the target for 6.5 maybe 7.5 to 5 to 8 maybe good enough but well the goals will be hv1c less than 7% a preprandial capillary plasma glucose which should ideally be 80 to 130 and a postprandial capillary plasma glucose ideally less than 180 mg but again we need to see that whether we are targeting 6.5 or 7 or 7.5 it should not happen on the cost of hypoglycemia which they are very very clearly classified level 1 hypoglycemia once your sugar is less than 70 mg level 2 is when your sugar is already dipping as low as 54 mg and level 3 is what is classically labeled as severe hypoglycemia where you need a medical assistance to come out of that for the first time 21 also and in 22 guideline they have incorporated and highlighted the importance of getting glycemic target targets reducing those glycemic variations so that glycemic variability has to be cut down for that ads today says that we must rely on continuous glucose monitoring maybe with the help of sensors or agps what dr saurav was just talking about an attempt has to be there that most of your patient for 70% of time they should be in time in range what is 70 to 180 mg less than 25% time it should be more than uh, 180 to 250 and less than 5% it should be more than 250 that means total time above range should not be more than 25% and hypoglycemia id is very very particular on that that it should not happen it should not be for more than 5% severe hypoglycemia which i just said grade 3 hypoglycemia or severe hypoglycemia should be for less than 1% so obviously that cannot be targeted all these targets cannot be met until unless we are doing a continuous glucose monitoring or maybe be an agp or other devices are being used so when it comes to the pharmacological treatment of 
hyperglycemia in adults with type 2 diabetes again keeping in mind that patient centric circle ADS says that first line therapy obviously will depend on the comorbidities so it has to be a patient centered treatment factors including cost for the first time they have talked about cost will in our guideline when I'll be talking about that we have kept a separate provision that all those patients those who cannot afford expensive therapy their choices have to be different but AD also now is talking about cost factor and access to the treatment because there also you have many patients those who are not covered under the medical insurance so if there is a presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or the risk is very very high with multiple risk factor patient has incipient or manifest heart failure or presence of diabetic nephropathy or CKD their clear options are either going on a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven CVD benefits or an SGLT2 with proven CVD benefits so irrespective of your glycemic goal we are not talking about getting a glycemic reduction here we are saying that every patient who has presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or diabetic nephropathy must be on GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors. If it is presence of heart failure, manifest or non-manifest, then obviously the first option is SGLT2 inhibitor because it scores over even GLP-1 receptor agonist not only in terms of reduction of hospitalization with heart failure but also composite CVD and heart failure uh, uh, overall figures are much better almost down by 20%. If it is about CKD, when it comes to presence of albuminuria, their GLP-1 receptor agonists are also very, very good. And SGLT2 inhibitors, they are proven to have reduction in renal composite endpoints by at least 35 to 40 percent if patient is not having all these risk factor or presence of heart failure or ckd then obviously what you are looking for is getting a very very efficacious reduction in hv1c so as to at least reduce onset or propagation of microvascular complication there again attempt has to be great emphasis is on reduction of hyperglycemia so drug option has to be something like dpp4 again glp1 receptor agonist or sglt2 or tzs are wonderful drug. i know dr panikar he is a greatest advocate about uh, usage of tzs pyoglitazone in this country so their ad also said that maybe tzs which is uh, a very good option in these patients. And an attempt has to be again to minimize weight gain, to promote weight loss idly, more than 5% or 7%. Obviously, their option will be something like GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2. But AD again here says that if it is a cost which is important because every patient may not be able to afford uh, what to talk about GLP-1 receptor agonist, there even SGLT2 inhibitors are $18 one tablet. So all those who are not covered there may not be able to use even SGLT2 inhibitors. So they may be a good candidate for even starting on sulfonylurea or TZs also. And they have again tried to uh, uh, stratify or make this pharmacological option based on their profile whether they reduce weight whether they reduce chance of getting hypoglycemia how good they are in terms of getting efficacy and you could see that metformin professor panikar was talking about that tame trial that metformin is a wonderful drug not only in terms of getting good glycemic reduction but other benefits are also there once it comes to sglt2 inhibitor we know that not only they are getting a modest amount of glycemic reduction but for extra glycemic reduction these are the best drugs and of course glp1 receptor agonist are the best drugs in terms of getting a highest amount of hv1c reduction after insulin without inducing any hypoglycemia so all these drugs need to be viewed in that light once it comes to new onset diabetes in youth patient those who are overweight or obesity with clinical suspicion of having type 2 diabetes this category has been put for the first time in the protocol or in the uh, algorithm that all those young onset diabetics if they are obese or they are overweight and there is a clinical suspicion that these patients are type 2 because at hyperglycemia onset you may not be able 
to do even C peptide levels to differentiate. So if patient is having clearly symptoms of acidosis or DK, obviously they are the candidates for insulin therapy. But if patients have HV1C less than 8.5, there's no acidosis, no ketosis, obviously you must start with metformin. So AD also today says that you must start with metformin. You may go as high as almost two gram per day still targets are not met within three months, then you can choose other drugs. But all those patients, those who have HVNC more than 8.5, no acidosis with or without ketosis, they again must be started on metformin, go up to up titration of two gram. If required to fix their fasting sugar, then a basal insulin could be the best option. So today, once it comes to cardiovascular disease and risk management, when we are talking about three-point mace reduction, it is not only glycemic control, which is important, after lifestyle modification and diabetes education, which remains the hallmark of any therapy, after glycemic management, it is a blood pressure control, which is very, very important. Equally important is lipid management in this patient with statin or with other drugs. And again, most important thing to reduce that cardiovascular risk is being on drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists. So all those patients in ADA, in summary said that conceding treatment goals for glycemia, blood pressure and dyslipidemia and older adults. I told you those patients, those who are young, young onset diabetes, here it is talking about elderly patients. So it says that if this patient is healthy, even if age is something like 65, but there is a longer remaining life expectancy, patient doesn't have too much comorbidities, again, it will be reasonable targeting even less than seven or close to seven. But those who have already complex intermediate scenario, couple of comorbidities are already there or there is a cognitive decline. Obviously, you should target something like eight. Their fasting could be anything 90 to 150, though they are not talking about 80 to 130, what is typically asked for. And obviously, bedtime sugar could be even as high as 100 to 180. But blood pressure control, again, here needs to be highlighted. It has to be less than 140, 90. And statins will be a good promising drug. But all those patients, those who have too much complexities, they are on other end. What I told you in ADA ASD 2012 guidelines also, at the other end of the disease with too many comorbidities or end stage diseases or already having uh, cognitive decline, there you may not have any glycemic target, something like 8 or 8.5, must attempt reducing the symptoms of hyperglycemia and you must not induce hypoglycemia. That is a very, very strong message by ADA. Let their fasting be between, between 100 to 180 and baseline bedtime sugars even as high as up to 200 milligram, but must get down their uh, blood pressure again less than 150, 90, and here also statin could be useful drug. And for the first time, ADA has also incorporated this KDGO uh, document, which has come in 2020, that to reduce the risk of chronic kidney disease progression, the frequency of visits and referral to nephrologists according to glomerular filtration rate and albuminuria. So in this uh, grid, on one hand, you have A1, A2, A3, what is albuminuria. On other hand, you have normal EGFR, and then it is going to come down. And based on that, wheresoever your patient is resting, you can see how poorer is going to be the prognosis. And earlier, these patients should be referred to a nephrologist. So coming to ACE guidelines, this is actually a 2020 guideline. and certain upgradation has been done. The principle of this ACE document are lifestyle modification. It underlies all therapies as has been sent by ADA. Again, as ADA said, we must avoid hypoglycemia, avoid weight gain, individualize all glycemic targets, whether it is HV1C, fasting or post ventral control. Optimal is obviously getting an HV1C less than 6.5, as close to 6.5 as possible without inducing hypoglycemia. That is very, very important. So choices has been, uh, again, uh, in the same way that you should choose drugs which could, say, address issue of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or renal status. Comorbidities, again, as said by ADA, must be identified and eluded or uh, addressed to get to goal as soon as possible. 
no, may, you may not wait for three months. What is typically said, you may intervene even in three, three weeks time or six weeks time until unless patient is at goal. Choice of therapy includes ease of use and affordability. And again, like ADA 22 said, CGM is highly recommended because that could be the only way if you are targeting something like 6.5 or 7 without inducing hypoglycemia. Great emphasis has been again on nutrition and intensity, intensity stratified by burden of obesity and related comorbid uh, situations or complication that you maintain an optimum weight, calorie restriction has to be followed, a physical activity of at least 150 minutes has to be followed and you must have a good quality of sleep which has not been talked in ADA or even in our own document. So we must have six to eight hours sleep so as to get in normal biorhythm because then your counter-regulatory hormones are on the lower side, your blood pressure will calm down and you will have a much better console, uh, glycemic control also. A behavioral sport has to be there and most important is that smoking cessation has to be there. So in this ACE document, they have divided into different models it talk, the first slide talks about complication, which is a centric model for care of the patient with overweight or obese patient. So for the first time, they have defined adiposity-based chronic disease management. So it said that in the first step, you look for the BMI of the patient. If BMI is less than 25 and it is no overweight because these are Caucasian patients, but if your BMI is already more than 25 or even 27, most important thing is to look for presence of cardiometabolic diseases or comorbidities and the impact of obesity like biomechanical complication which could happen in the setting of type 2 diabetes and based on that you need to choose the therapeutic agents for improvement in complication. You must simultaneously treat uh, these uh, issues of obesity and it has to be of course first thing has to be the lifestyle modification that has to continue but again a great emphasis is on medical therapy to reduce weight which could be in uh, different ways either drugs like uh, uh, fentaramine topiramate combinations or naltroxin combination or lorcastrin unfortunately these drugs are not Approved in our country, liraglutide also, we don't have a, uh, we have been using off-label, 3 milligram was not available, but in US all these drugs are already available, so a great emphasis has been even to have a medical therapy to induce weight reduction. If BMI is very, very high, something like more than 35, a surgical therapy in the form of an endoscopic procedure or a gastric mending or could be a sleeve or bypass surgery. In pre-diabetes algorithm by ACE, again it talks about lifestyle modification and it again says that you must treat atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk factor even if there is not too much of hyperglycemia to label it as type 2 diabetes but again you must treat or address to atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk factors by uh, statins and try to correct that dyslipidemia patient hypertension try to correct that also and every effort has to be there so that these pre-diabetes patients don't get converted into type 2 diabetes. We know in India we have close to 75 million diabetics and an equal number of pre-diabetes patients. So every effort has to be there by having at least a lifestyle modification, not drugs but certain drugs like metformin, a carbose could be used from uh, based on overall profile of the patient. TZ we know although it increases weight but this has been a wonderful drug once it comes to reduction in insulin resistance also. So in terms of reduction of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, I told you dyslipidemia management has to be there starting with lifestyle modification and then based on the levels, we need to again quantify that risk, stratify that risk, how bad is that risk in that particular individual. If risk is very, very high, you have to go on very high doses of statin. So it says that LDL targets are based on the risk which is present. If it is high risk, LDL, LDL has to be less than 100. If it is very high, it has to be less than 70. All those patients, those who have extreme high risk of CVD, their LDL ideally should be less than 55. So same way they have also identified the targets so TGs and ApoB also which need to be addressed. Once it comes to management of hypertension in these patients, ACE and ARB for every type 2 diabetes patient or even at a stage of pre-diabetes, 
but for better hypertension reduction or blood pressure reduction, you may go on calcium channel blocker. These days you have second, third generation calcium channel blockers, maybe beta blocker, or even thiazide group of safer thiazide groups of diuretics also. So finally, uh, uh, ACE, when it talks of glycemic control, it clearly individualizes the goals of getting HbA1c, not seven, what has been said by ADA, it talks about 6.5 for all those patients where there are not much concurrent chronic illnesses or comorbidities and where you can get HVNC less than 6.5 without inducing hypoglycemia, that is very, very important. But all those patients, those who already have comorbidities, obviously target will be something like 7 or 7.5. You need to start with lifestyle modification. But one most important thing which is there in any algorithm in Indian international guideline is independent of glycemic control, if you have presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factor, CKD or diabetic nephropathy or heart failure, these patients must be on GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT-2 irrespective of the glycemic control. Even if patient is already having 6.8, better reduce other drugs, maybe even you may reduce metformin, but make a space for usage of GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT-2 inhibitors so as to reduce overall cardiovascular risk in these patients. So ACE only talks about entry-level HV1C. If it is less than 7.5, you may, in typical patient, garden variety of patient, you may start with metformin, but all those who have multiple risk factor, you must start with GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT-2 inhibitors. If entry level HVNC is 7.5 to 9, you can have dual therapy, which must include other than metformin, ideally in a GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGLT-2 inhibitor, but if entry level HVNC is more than 9%, and patient is too much symptomatic, that is the time where you may start with basal insulin and then intensify it to, uh, this is how you start with the basal insulin. If HVNC is less than 8%, you give only 0.1 to 0.2 units per kg. If it is already more than 8%, you may start with 0.2 to 0.3 units, and these are the algorithms to down-tighten it or up it the doses. But if still targets are not met, in spite of getting a good fasting control with basal insulin, that is the time you must add prendrial, which could be basal plus one, basal plus two, basal plus three, or it could be a physiological basal bolus therapy. Again, like ADA, even ACE has given the profile of anti-hyperglycemic medication. It is too busy a slide. I'll not go, be going into the detail, but again, suffice to say that many patients may do well with metformin, but most of the patient, those who have these complexities, presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or maybe diabetic nephropathy or heart failure, better be on SGLT2 inhibitors or maybe drugs like GLP-1 receptor agonist. But DPP-4, it said, are classically neutral on all the outcomes, but they are very good in terms of getting good glycemic control. For the first time, ACE has included diabetes management in Neffeld in the guideline, and it advocates that fibrosis risk stratification has to be done if it is low, intermediate, or high. Based on that, we must optimize glycemic control. Again, it talks about that we must use either GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2, and again, what Dr. Panikar will say that every patient those who are even at a low risk or intermediate risk for developing Neffeld and subsequently NASH, they must be on pyoglitazone because even in that PVN style, we have seen that it was pyoglitazone where uh, almost ballooning or steatohepatitis was reversed in the uh, group which has type 2 diabetes. Now, coming to RSSD ASI therapeutic wheel, I told you it is very close to my heart. We are sh shortly revising this with a new wheel which will be getting published in 2022, this year only. This is ABCDFGH approach. This is for the first time any guideline has talked about all these spokes. And we, I'm happy to share in this small gathering, uh, we had a lot of mentors like Dr. Panika, Shashank was there, and it was a joint consensus with Endocrine Society of India. Dr. Jacob is here, Professor Madhu was one of the convener for this. But this wheel, for the first time in 2015, was drawn, conceived by me, and it was drawn by one, one of my DNB student, Dr. Ashwin. We sat on this wheel along with Bansi and Madhu on the airport for three to four hours in a very hot summer because Bansi was traveling to 
some ESD or some conference, and we could get three to four hours sitting on the airport outside, not inside. And we alluded to this that how to put all the spokes in this wheel. So A is advancing age, B is BMI, in increasing BMI, C is presence of CKD. This was very tricky when we talk about lifestyle modification in the center, and we in Indian guidelines, we talk about usage of metformin for every patient until unless there are contraindication. So how to put this C in this? So we cut metformin here. You could see that that blue graph, that blue circle is cut here because if there is an advancing CKD, we may not be able to continue metformin till long. D is the duration of diabetes. Is established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, what AD and ACE are talking about. F is the financial status. We were very, very sensitive to Indian patient. Not many patients, those, those times, even generic SGLT2s were not available, will be able to afford GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitor. H is proneness to hypoglycemia, and G is the glycemic status. In the centrary lifestyle modification, then metformin for every patient, and then you have green circle, which says that all drugs, all anti-diabetic drugs could be used safely. Here, you may something like, even while uh, uh, sitting in this conference, you may prescribe on WhatsApp, because all drugs in this zone are safe. But mind it, as we are moving from the center towards the periphery, you have an orange zone and a red zone, because towards the red zone, options are getting very, very narrowed. The hierarchy of therapy is dep depicted in a clockwise manner. I don't have time on this. I made a presentation 45 minutes alone on this wheel because every drug here is based on evidence. It is not the, not just that we have put sub SGLT2. You could see that in BMI, the first option is SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist. But as your BMI is even going higher, so SGLT2 and GLP-1 receptors are getting even a higher hierarchy. Same way you could see the presence of CKD. If CKD is advancing, last option in the red circle are only DPP-4, which have a dual route of excretion, and maybe insulin. Similarly, in the F column, you could see that financial constraint is there. The best option may be a conventional sulfonylurea or a conventional insulin or pyoglitazone, fortunately, which is very, very reasonably priced in this. So how to use this wheel? This wheel is designed to be a very simple user-friendly approach to decide the appropriate anti-diabetic agent to be used in type 2 diabetes. Whenever you see a patient in your clinic, try to identify two to three important concerns. Out of that, out of A, B, C, D, F, G, H, try to pick up what is important. In certain patients, it may be presence of CKD. In certain patients, it, it may be financial consent or age. And based on that, you get the best option. NICE guideline 2022, again, is very, very conventional, very, very conservative guideline. We know because there it is an NHS system. They are still banking on sulfonylurea and metformin and maybe insulin. Even still now in their algorithm, we don't find a place of using GLP-1 receptor agonist, you could see at the bottom only, if there are no options left, ideally you should start with metformin in every patient. If patient is not tolerating, you may just give a modified release metformin. You could choose drugs like DPP-4, PIO, or sulfonylurea, which are very, very reasonably priced. But you could also choose SGLT2 inhibitor, depending on the presence of ASCVD or other things. And if the risk is very, very high, again, it, it says start with metformin, add SGLT2 inhibitor. But at the bottom only, it says that if patient cannot tolerate SGLT2 inhibitor, benefits are still not enough. That is the time you may refer it to an endocrinologist. Get an approval for starting a GLP-1 receptor agonist. This is where it is. In the last, you could see the GLP at the bottom. So it conventionally still talks of using metformin, DPP-4, pyoglitazone, and sulfonylurea. Maybe you may add SGLT2, not in every patient. In our algorithm, we are talking of SGLT2 inhibitor as a first-line option. It says, forget about glycemic control. Every patient must be on SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist if there is a complex situation. But still, nice guidelines being very, very conservative because of financial constraint says that GLP could be the last option where you cannot use insulin. After SGLT2, you still don't have good glycemic control. You are not being able to address other things. You may still choose a insulin, but certain patients may not be the right candidate, like those who are driving, those who are pilots. 
may not be the right candidate for very high dose insulin there you need to have a permission for choosing glp1 receptor agonist towards and ada asd well these guidelines are getting upgraded still this is the current information till last night that they have already made the protocol the practical tips for implementation of ada asd joint consensus are out but this has to come somewhere i think i'm sure this may get published in asd uh, in this september but before i close i think although kedigo guidelines was not part of my presentation but i thought it is very very important because there has been a great emphasis not only on lifestyle and first line drugs like metformin sglt2 ras blockers phenanon is about to get launched statins must be there so new mras uh, glp1 receptor agonist antiplatelet drugs and lipid management is going to be crux even in those patient where we are targeting goal uh, di uh, directed or mediated therapy so this uh, kedigo guideline talk about lifestyle modification in the beginning start with metformin as a first line option continue till egfr 30 don't add a new patient after 45 but if it is a situation of dialysis you must stop metformin again sglt2 inhibitor based on current data from EMPA heart failure and DEPA heart failure and DEPA CKD. Now they are talking about that SGLT2 you could use till EGFR 20, but don't initiate if EGFR is already very low. But if patient is going for dialysis there, you need to stop that. You could continue GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are preferred drugs, DAPP-4 inhibitors, till end stage renal disease even in dialysis patient. Insulin is possibly the gold standard for those patients. Short-acting sulfonylurea or non sulfonylurea secretocoag or even uh, AGIs could be good option if EGFR is already less than 30. Thank you very much for your patience listening and uh, I'll be very happy if you have any questions to ask.